The GovX Show is supported by Forrester, helping government organisations perform at their best. Visit forrester.com to learn more. Hello again. Welcome to another episode of the GovX Show. I'm Tim Coulthard, Community Director at GovX Digital and your regular host of the show. Joining me today is Jeremy Edwards, who is the Head of Digital Channels at the Department for Work and Pensions. DWP Digital has got some amazing projects going on. And Jeremy's going to explain how, as an organisation that really is a cradle to grave in terms of touch points for our lives, how they manage those different levels of capability, how they manage innovation versus reliability, and what's coming down the line in terms of automation, uh, digitizing services, digitizing contact points. So loads to unpack there. Good news is he's also gonna join us at the Citizen Experience Show in November for a panel discussion. I'm gonna share information about that so you can register and come along for that live conversation at the end of the show. And I'll put the link to book in the show notes accompanying this episode as well. So loads going on, loads to talk about. Let's jump into the conversation now. So Jeremy, welcome to the GovX show. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. Pleasure, pleasure. So we're going to talk a bit about your work, um, DWP and DWP Digital. Uh, lots of exciting change happening there, lots of initiatives, lots of projects. Um, and we're going to look at a bit about that. Uh, but before we jump into some of those specifics, maybe you could just set the scene a bit for us. So uh, tell us a bit about your role and your professional background and what your sort of focus <coughs> is on at DWP Digital right now. Yeah, of course. So I head up digital channels within DWP Digital. So I look after all the technology that allows us to talk to our customers, that allows our customers to talk to us via channels, <clears throat> some, some online, but predominantly telephony letters. We still send a lot of letters to customers, uh, web chat, texts, um, and so on. So all, all that technology that, that processes the incoming customer contact and the outgoing customer contact. So it's a team of about 200 colleagues that spread all, all out through the UK. We'd be doing 20, 30 well, relatively large projects at any one time. <clears throat> but our, our prim primary reason is to improve the customer experience for DWP customers across all of our different benefit types. Uh, and we really do serve the whole population at various stages in their life events. So it's really quite interesting uh, to get into the psychology and, and the, the, the the processes that people go through and how we decide how we communicate with them via different channels. Yeah. You my must background. Have... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say my background, I've worked in contact centers for gosh, 20 odd years, uh, originally operational leadership, but then I got into change running big change programs. I spent quite a long time at Royal Mail building all their contact center network across the UK. And I've been with DWP for just over four years now. Okay. Great stuff. Interesting. I, I think, um, you know, <clears throat> we, we might come back to this, but looking back across 20 years of what, what sort of contacts and touch points existed and were predominant in in that era versus versus what you've got now so we might kind of revisit some of that it's interesting to hear that yeah of course and, and yeah. as you said you know dwp it is a huge organization i mean i i read a stat that said that, you know the payments it handles around 190 billion a year probably more than that now i don't know yeah, so there's, it is. <laughs> there's a huge amount of money there's a huge amount of contact points and as you said it's it's kind of cradle to grave stuff isn't it in the sense of how many interactions and potential touch points yeah. there are across no it is and it is i mean we've got roughly about hundred thousand colleagues working at dwp it, that changed because of the pandemic you know we, we had to urgently recruit quite a lot of people to help uh to support the the, the color customers that were losing their roles, losing their jobs, et cetera. So we did expand really quickly and I'll probably touch on that as well because that was quite an interesting experience yeah. to move through yeah. uh, in certainly my career and I think probably most people's. Um, but I guess in terms of the department, yeah, and, and we do, you know, so you think about somebody that's uh, the different demographics of the different audiences that we serve in terms of customers, they will have a completely different digital propensity, yeah. a completely different need. So uh, particularly in the pensions, so the, the work at the pension retirement services space, they tend to have one big touch point when they retire and then they get regular updates and it's not a, a two week conversation. Um, customers that are receiving universal credit, we, we talk to them all the time to help them to get back into employment and support them with their, their uh, work coach type activities. And then people on child benefit, for example, we're helping to manage a whole network of, of different stakeholders in their lives. So uh, different points, different types of interactions, different propensities, um, some want to talk to us, some don't, you know, so it's, yeah. it's quite an interesting sort of thing we need to think about. And also how we, we sit as part of the wider 
uh, government offer for citizens and how we interact with our other partners across the the uh, the, the, the different departments HMRC um, for example is, is quite yeah. a big one yeah because it's said many times but it's it's said because it's true you know the average citizen doesn't necessarily care or make the distinction between different departments no the government no. is the government or whatever and <clears> this <throat> idea of you know single touch point single digital front door for services you know it's essentially you know gov.uk was kind of driven by by that outlook and yeah. so interesting yeah definitely where it's come how far it's come already and how far it could go i guess i suspect that, that when we have you know, quite a lot of big topics around this and i think it does some of that does come back to the life cycle of somebody that you know if, if a pensioner wants to just touch base with us once for the next 10 years do you really want to go through the the whole process of enrollment etc and identification verification maybe you know that's we, we do an awful lot of work around research with customers and making sure that what we do is you know, predominantly user driven customer driven um, to meet their needs and we've got oodles of research on that but yeah you do still have to think about where the benefits lie and where and where the cost outweighs that as well yeah, yeah. so numerous touch points are you know cradle to grave and you, you mentioned that the sort of customer experience is absolute key to that but i guess you know when you're talking about sort of government services and so on it's it's not the fun stuff that people are looking to sort of enjoy they just presumably just want to get in and out get what they need done and, and move on so what's the sort of cx philosophy uh for dwp i mean how do you approach it uh and, and sort of how is it to regard in terms of its importance to the organization very much thinking about life events and outcomes very much thinking about you know a little bit what I touched on but in more depth what what is the purpose of this interaction or on, on on is it a um is it something that where we can improve the service? Is it something where we we can improve the lives of the citizen? We, 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 there's a number of principles that we have, and the broad I'd inter, inter, interpret them by saying it's around making sure that we can be customer centric, where we can deliver the best value for the taxpayer at the same time, and those two do you know um, collide to a certain degree at times. And I think that was one of the big things for me moving from the private sector into government as a sense that you know, previously we'd have a customer value we do crm we look at retention all those sort of things and you know we don't have any competition there's no other dwp to go to if you're, if you're not happy so but that doesn't detract from the need to, to deliver good customer service and to, and to track nps and to track all of those things because it's important that people feel that they're getting the good service from any government department but particularly with for dwp for my focus so you know we do generally take it really seriously We've got huge uh, resources dedicated to customer experience, a customer experience director, teams of people looking at outcomes, looking at how we improve our services. You know, now some of our services, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're absolutely vital and there's a whole safeguarding thing there as well that we have to think about. So again, mindful when we're thinking about voice of the customer, we think about voice of the customer, but also making sure that that customer isn't um, in any risk or in, in that sense as well. So there's all different dimensions to it as well, Tim, that we have to think about. Yeah, absolutely. So clearly there's a, there's a deep there's a deep philosophy there and a deep sort of commitment to that to that customer experience so in terms of how it plays out on the ground as it were what, are there any sort of particular projects or bits of work that that you and your team have worked on in recent years and i, and I guess sort of 18 months just past would, would have accelerated a lot of that that you would regard as kind of having been particularly significant maybe represents sort of leap forward in some way anything that stands yeah. out for you there's a few things. I think out the wider DWP Digital, we, we, we accelerate a number of, of uh, online services. So, for example, Get Your State Pension is a fully digitized service that we, we've been pushing for customers to use and pandemic accelerated the development around that. And there's a few others. Some of our identity services where we can make sure that the person that we're talking to is the right person. Again, we've accelerated some of those things. But linked to that in my space, um, we've launched a telephony identification and verification service for a number of our benefit lines where we you know we we do that piece and we're enabling the customer to shorten the wait time that they have and when they're passed over to an agent then if they have been successfully identified and verified then that takes that whole piece out of the customer so it improves the customer journey particularly for repeat customers as well because they'll get used to the types of things that they are going to be asked and it will improve their service uh, we've introduced web chat as, as in one of our business lines as well and I think part of the this is an interesting sort of dilemma when you think about there is you've got to think about the cost per transaction or interaction based on as I say the 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 the, the need to to give good customer service but to balance competition and also the types of conversations that we have don't always lend themselves to be a traditional web chat that you would have with a service provider for your internet for example 
Um, but we have found that's been really successful, particular parts of the community that don't actually want to have a telephone call that somebody else in the house can hear, for example. So that's a different dynamic, as well as improving the service lines. <clears throat> we can all of a sudden start to do something that makes a difference in terms of privacy and, and so on as well. So that type of thing we've done. We transformed the letters side, uh, and you know, it's strange in a, a, a digital conference we've talked about letters, but we, you know, we the policy reasons, the other reasons, and also accessibility and the, and the customer base that we serve. We do send out millions of letters every year as well, but we've accelerated a big project there, so and to bring it all in a, in a brand new platform that we have, where we can make changes to letters quickly, but also in the future we can capture customers' preference. So we can start to send out letters via email based on the content of that letter and the privacy involved, but also the future, um, I'm going to, I use the word portals, but I think that's quite a dated term, but on, online experiences we can upload and potentially in the future give the same services you'd have from your bank where you can go and download your own notification like we do every day for our own statements and so on from, yeah. from financial organizations. So it was a massive building block to, to enable that for the future as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we are. We, we're, we're on a massive transformation across DWP Digital. It's you know, one of the largest um, digital organizations in the UK and significant amounts of investment, but we have quite a legacy um, starting point in terms of a lot of the mainframe systems that we have and um, a lot of the, our ability to get real time information Sometimes where we've got some of the newer projects or newer services, it's fine. But some of the older ones, we've had to use robots to pull data from and so on, so that we can give the, we can we can go real time. But it's not it's it's not as graceful as it would be with a contemporary system that we put in. Yeah. Um. Now our our primary benefit going forward is universal credit. The universal credit application that we use is contemporary, is modern, is built in a robust, scalable architecture. And that was tested through the pandemic. You know, we had a million uh, applications in one day right at the start of the pandemic. You know, we were, weren't able to process a million, but we processed significantly more than we ever ever done before. And the platform was ro robust. Um, we all, during that time as well, we all started to work at home some of the time. So we rolled out teams and, and how we collaborate. So even just how we work together yeah. changed dramatically and that's still happening the way that we we work together now in a much more of a hybrid model based on the outcome we're looking to achieve every day yeah. Yeah. is driving location so all of those sort of things all came together you know uh, to, to sort of really transform the way in which we work yeah and you know we heard so many stories of you know services and, and digital pivots being made during the pandemic and I guess what what's interesting now is what sticks and what reverts back and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and in different organisations, we have conversations and, and it, they're at different levels of sort of understanding what the future is going to look like. Do you have a yeah. sense yet in terms of the way you and DWP Digital are working of what would you like to hang on to in terms of whether it's culture, whether it's processes, whether it's systems, platforms, whatever it might be? What do you want to hang on to and maybe build upon or sort of formalize that was, was done quickly? And, and Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, definitely the hybrid working piece is, is, I think that's probably the same for most. You know, we, 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 we get such a lot of benefit in terms of giving, giving our colleagues more flexibility, but also avoiding the lengthy commutes and so on. So we, always, we gain productivity at the same time as build flexibility. And also it's enabling us to attract different types of talent pools than we have done before as well in terms of, uh, the type of people that are quite happy to work in that way so that's one area um governance is one area where you know for, for various reasons we have to do a lot of things quite quickly we probably roll back a little bit in that sense but that's quite right for the amount of controls that we need to have for the spend that we, we have we've also collaborated we built relationships across the department between our digital side of things our chain side of teams and our operational colleagues that and they've been strengthened uh, because we all had to you know do, do a lot of things really quickly so that's that's been something that's, that's carried through and that that culture of doing things quickly across the department and having different types of communication methods has stuck and i think will will stick for the future as well um i think how we've used some of our partner organizations so we work with a lot of partner organizations consultancies and so on and again how we've how we've taken best practice from from those guys too and still working very closely given the scale of things that we need to do that's going to stick and that makes a difference in terms of making sure that we can be innovative in the things that we do um yeah i mean lots it's probably some obvious things i can't think of the top of my head to be honest with you but it, it does feel a very different place and you know much more progressive place 
but I don't think we've lost. I think now we've, we haven't lost some of those controls that we need to have, given the investment that we make on behalf of the taxpayer. Yeah, of, of course, of course. And and I'm interested in this idea of, of of change because I suppose you know for for a digital team, there's lots of things you could do, but you have to sort of find find balance, find balance between the different types of end user. You know, you might have digital natives who will do everything online versus people near end of life and retirement age who still want letters and so on. So, I guess how do you find this balance between innovating and you know finding efficiencies and you know making better use of the, of the taxpayers uh, money and so on mm. versus continuing to deliver reliability and you know user focused services that give the people what they want not necessarily what the digital team enjoys working on or whatever you know how do you yeah no really that good balance? one no I th- and i think that there, are, there are some frameworks and some safeguards in there as well so the, the gds standards that we, we apply when we've got a, a citizen facing service the types of accessibility checks that we need to go through the types of service standard assessment so that there are a whole series of things that when we launch a service we need to make sure we've gone through them all on a more formal side just to give that protection um on an in, no not an informal side but on a, on a more gathering insight side we have done a huge amount of work around discoveries pre-discoveries working with a number of agencies, working with people like the Citizens Advice or RNIB, so we get that insight into what people want. And that's allowed us to see, for example, the number of customers that are more than one benefit and how when they are more than one benefit, it lends itself for them to interact in, in, in a more account portal type way because they can see that those benefits being brought together. So, for example, if they want to change address, they don't have to call two different numbers and so on. So that type of insight which, which sounds a bit niche, but given the scale that we do, it isn't, um, has enabled us to look how we're designing some of the services right now and in the next couple of years. So we've done a lot of that. Um, in, the, in the accessibility side of things, you know, we, we, look, we look at all sorts of different formats that we can serve customers with, you know, in terms of uh, instead of just sending letters. Um, we we've really have deliberately spent a lot of time and effort getting under the skin of what our customers really want. And then how we then balance that, as I said, right at the start, against making sure we get fair value for the for the taxpayer, and also stick to the to, to the um, ambit of the vote that we've got as a department. So getting all that balance, and I think sometimes that's that's experience that people have, that's the depth of understanding, but that's also having a number of people that are in the department that have worked outside, that are customer experience professionals, that are, have worked on organisations that are driven by mps and retention and customer value etc so trying to bring that external viewpoint in so that we can get that again um you know attention if you like the healthy tension around over engineering a service or making sure that the service is, is customer focused that's a real big thing we've done within the department as well and not just within digital there have been a number of people that have joined in, in operational customer experience teams customer excellence teams as well to, to again to help to you know, it's not a pull and a push in terms of operations would like to have X, Y, and Z or digital want to push all the latest funky things. It genuinely is a collaboration. We've got multidisciplinary teams working together so that you've got all of those different angles and aspects coming together to help to, to sort of drive out an outcome. Um, and, and we do have, you know, we do do innovation. We have an innovation team within digital that are looking at a few years out and can test and learn quite quickly and fail fast if things don't. And that's helped me uh, we're doing some work around video at the moment. They were able to do a quick market sweep and some look out there where the trends are within video uh, and things like that. So we, you can start to inform your learning with that type of team as well. And I think the other other one is just how we try not to put our own persona and exp- experience on what we think is a good customer experience. So, yeah. yeah, of course, we're all online all the time and, you know, completely digital savvy. And it's really easy to make that jump to think, well, that's yeah. what everybody's like these days, you know, and it's just winding that back, just having that knowledge of your, 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 your unconscious bias in that space as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and in terms of that sort of looking ahead to what's coming piece, um, uh, you're joining us for the um, at the Citizen Experience show for the panel discussion around, it's called service automation and the future of self-service, which hints at possibilities ahead, I guess. Um, yeah. Curious to, to hear from you what, what that kind of means to you, really. I mean, what, what do you see as the opportunities that are coming down the line in terms of automation, improving the citizen experience through those kind of tools and technologies? Yeah, of course. So I, I think automation is quite a, an interesting term in itself. So we, we within the department have an intelligent automation team that d- d- deliver robots, but they are p- predominantly focused on how do we reduce the amount of manual processing that we do um, and, and taking out steps of, of tasks, but they're not customer facing. 
But without them in the background, we wouldn't be able to improve the services as fast as we can. The example I gave you earlier about how we can pull data from some legacy services. But customers wouldn't know, but we are doing things. So, for example, if you send in a fit note, uh, an automation processes part of that fit note and sends a customer text to say, we've got your fit note. You don't need to contact us. We'll be in touch with you in 20 days, whatever the target is at the moment. But we, that's an automation in, in itself, a robot autom RPA aut automation in the background. So there's some of that going on. I think sometimes when we think about the term automation, we mean digitization. We mean how do we do self-serve and online services. So we've got across digital a number of initiatives going on to bring that um, digital first service and bringing more things online for the customer to do. We're in the middle of a big piece of work looking at how do we tackle that topic that we had earlier around one government, one 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 log on, if you like, one account. What does that mean? Is it right for the department? And are the things that we could do as a stepping stone to some of those things? We've got a lot of work going on with an identification and verification so that we are able to, it's, it's almost like these foundation blocks that we need to have to be able to make that leap. So without being able to use various sources to make sure that the person is who they say they are and that they are able to talk to us about the topic that they want to talk to us about or converse with us about. Again, that's a big piece of work that we've got on, uh, uh, going at the moment. I think taking it more to my world, we've got a project coming up at the moment around a conversational platform. So a lot of the automations we have in the telephony side are traditional um, DTMF IBR uh, or based on that. This is how we do uh, the ability for a customer to talk to us with a natural language. And either we help the customer to understand whether they can serve themselves online, or we use their intent to interpret what they actually want to do and make it more simple for them to be uh, handed off to the right team to deliver on their outcome. Or, and this is the, the, this is the, the big thing for me, is we can self-serve in a much more customer-friendly um, way and listen to to what they're saying we can help them to then that would get processed and so on so that's a big project that we've got going on in the next well the pilots is a few months away um we'll probably talk about it more next year's conference in terms of the set, but we know we we, we, we know that we this is a typical thing that customers are coming more and more used to doing um and we're a little bit behind the curve and we're making a really big investment yeah but to make that that's really great telephony voice front end it's how we make sure all the other bits behind the scenes can help us to the, do that self-service as well. So that's thing for us. Um, chatbot as well is tied into that. We have a number of internal chatbots. Again, chatbot for us probably just means helping a customer to navigate a website more as opposed to having a, a conversation where we self-serve their request. It may just help them to talk to us a bit more um, around a, a typical topic. Web chat in the right circumstances more and more text notifications to help to proactively say to a customer this is happening you know the um change in universal credit that, that happened or is happening right right now we use text or uh, text to, to to keep customers in the loop as, as, as well as all the other media that we use so lots and lots of things going on to improve the customer experience in that sense um particularly in that customer view um portal type activity yeah, it's that's really great to hear what's what's coming next. Because I think, you know, much as we'd all like to think the future is science fiction and you know holograms popping out of your laptop to help you, the reality is that certainly in the in the in the short term, it's about getting the grunt work automated and getting that, that stuff that definitely, definitely. And that yeah, sort of stuff. definitely. We we're yeah. going into a comprehensive spending review, and there's there's you know there's I'm sure we'd like to make a much larger investment than we probably will do, but that's to try and make sure that we balance all the d demands across government. So how we how we do things smarter in, in a real sense, uh, but still look at how do we modernize a lot of those legacy applications that we've got. You know, we some of our mainframes, that run, we, we remediated them over the last 18 months and brought them in-house. That's enabled the speed increases. It will enable us to start to think about the replacements and so on. So there's some really big underpinning Fun, uh, foundational work within our tech services organization we're looking at zero trust models we've transformed the estate in terms of not just teams but also the equipment that we use we enabled i think it's twelve thousand people to work at home in the space of two months a lot of kit that we provided out so it was a huge huge logistical task for my colleagues in a different part of digital to do that and then they've been building on that with with various layers of, of um, reliability and so on to keep that going yeah and and the conversation we're going to be having around this um at the event in november you're going to be with colleagues from ofsted and uh, 
land registry and for you what's interesting what are you sort of looking forward to sharing and then maybe learning in exchange from from your peers across other organizations definitely some of the piece we've been doing around customer insight and, and, and particularly voice of the customer and how do we we build on that so that it's not simply a this is the top 10 reasons why customer contact us but how do we get under the skin of patterns and trends and start to help us to design the next uh, digital services for us so that's a key thing there's always knowledge share going on across the piece in any case but i think it's really interesting to see whether there's been what's been driven in terms of the question you asked me around what's going to be sticky post pandemic i'd like to you know explore that as well in terms of what's been what's going to be sticky post pandemic in terms of customer experience and customer contact um, and so on things like that we 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 also know there's some exemplar government services out there um, where the, there has been a total end-to-end -end digitization of that service passport agency comes to mind in terms of the work they've done you know so again other people are, are using that as an exemplar it'd be interesting to see what stage of the journey people are on and how do they test and learn how do they make sure that that, that we don't go into the, the the bias piece that i touched on we are constantly consulting with the customers of our services and doing the value for money test at the same time that would yeah. be really interesting great and and so gratifying to hear you know all the conversations we've had there's so much there's this sort of somebody used this a bit of a cheesy phrase but the government's got its mojo back in the sense of bit <laughs> under yeah. crisis you kind of find your true metal yeah. and i think there's a real kind of impetus around change there's a real commitment not that there ever wasn't but there's a real renewed vigor in terms of improving citizen services improving outcomes that customer focus you know it's the yeah. drumbeat of so much that's happening right now in yeah. civil service it is and, and there's but and there's a lot of larger programs of activity as well around modernization civil service civil service reform paper etc that was issued and how do we start to think about what's the future of the civil service and where th those things do help to shape and frame some of the things we do and the the, the investment that we make within leadership and thinking about the apprenticeship schemes that we've got running and how do we you know all that type of thing it, that's the foundations of how we go forward as well and, and so that's incredibly important to us um, within my team i've got a number of apprentices i've got a number of people doing um, sponsored future leadership scheme activities that type of fast stream activity as well and it it, it gives that balance of team that the team have made up of a really eclectic bunch in the nicest possible way of people that have been long-term civil servants and people that are uh, contractor or partner organizations or relatively new and it just makes that when you do start to get into that debate around how do we do this and we're having a workshop etc just the, the, the richness of it, um, opinion and experience just helps really to drive to some pretty funky out outcomes in that space yeah we hear that again and again that the most successful customer focused teams are the ones that are the, the most diverse i mean there's no no mystery there right you've got that sort of no. diversity of cognitive <laughs> thought but yeah, yeah. It's, it's still easy to, to sort of not recognize your blind spots so you know good great to hear that that's the kind of the kind of team you're working with um it, yeah. it only helps right it just adds value yeah. yeah great so yeah we've pretty much covered a lot of ground there i think um it's been it's been really great to hear kind of how you're thinking about and then executing that kind of customer focus that citizen experience in terms of the projects you're doing in terms of the culture in terms of ways of working so been a, been a great conversation and i think it's time to it's time to let you go and uh, get on with the get on with the day job but just want to say jamie thanks so much for joining us looking forward to having you uh, join us for the conference in november but thank you thank you once again for the conversation no problem thank you i've enjoyed it so there we have it. My thanks again to Jeremy for joining me for that conversation, sharing a bit of info about how DWP is working, how uh, CX is playing out, how technology is helping and how the organization's culture remains resolutely focused on the end user. As I mentioned, he's going to be taking part in a panel discussion that's part of the Citizen Experience Show that's happening in November. Uh, specifically, he's taking part in the panel discussion that's called Service Automation, the Future of Self-Service. And he'll be joining colleagues from Ofsted and Her Majesty's Land Registry as well. So lots going on there, lots of conversations, some really innovative projects, innovative organisations. So one not to be missed. That session is happening on the 11th of November, specifically at 3.30pm. But the, the show runs across two weeks, uh, 50 plus presentations going on. So lots to have a look at. So I'll put a link in the episode to show notes so you can get involved, sign up. It's free to register as always. And we can't wait to see you there. Until the next time, though, that's it. Bye bye.